The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. Wives, love your husbands. Hello and welcome to the program Words to Live By. In this series of programs, we are examining the home and the family. And while this topic is too broad and vast for us to be able to cover every scenario or potential idea for discussion, we do hope to give you God's instructions for the home and family and thus give you words to live by. You can then take these words and use them as your rules and guidelines to follow when making decisions about your own situations regarding the home and family. We are examining the roles and responsibilities of people within the home and family. And in our last program, Cliff Goodwin began a study called Wives Love Your Husbands. In that program, he pointed out that the older, faithful women were to teach the younger women to regard their husbands and keep their families. He also said that wives complete the husbands. When we look at the book of Genesis, we see that God said it was not good for man to be alone, so he created woman as a help meet or appropriate for him. In this program, Cliff Goodwin returns to look at the three ways that husbands need the wives. First, he'll talk about how the husband needs the wife domestically. Then he'll cover how husbands need wives sexually. And finally, he will talk about how husbands need wives both spiritually and emotionally. Most of our Bible texts today will come from the book of Proverbs, so if you'd like to open your Bible and go ahead and turn over there now. Cliff Goodwin is going to finish up this lesson called Wives Love Your Husbands as we continue to look at the roles and responsibilities of how individuals are to act and fulfill their roles and responsibilities within the home and family. Open your Bibles with us now as Cliff Goodwin will finish off this particular lesson. By now number two as we proceed to the second area in which your husband needs you to love him. He depends on you sexually. I don't know if you've ever looked at it this way, but each of you in the audience, husbands and wives, try to go back briefly now in your mind to your wedding day. Try to go back visually in your minds to that day that you stood probably facing one another, holding each other's hands, and on the day that you therein vowed yourselves to each other till death do you part. Go back to your wedding day. Now, sisters, and for that matter, also brothers, I don't know if you've ever looked at it this way. But on that day, when you vowed yourselves to each other, let me tell you something that you were saying, in essence. You were saying this, whether it came out explicitly or not, you were saying this. You were agreeing to be the only acceptable and proper source of sexual fulfillment for your spouse for the rest of his or her life. The way Brother Alan Webster put it, I think not in this power, power volume, but in another one, the one dealing with Proverbs, when we agreed, when I agreed to become Beth's husband and when Beth agreed to become my wife, we were agreeing implicitly that I was going to be her only source, her only hope for sexual fulfillment. And she was agreeing to that for me. And thereby is implied that we're not only to be sexually available, but also sexually responsive to our spouses. Now the day that you vowed yourselves to each other, that is what you were agreeing to. And friends, those of us who are trying to live the Christian life, those of us who understand fornication is a damnable sin, adultery is a damnable sin, we have tied ourselves and we have limited ourselves as God would have us only to you as our spouse. I think sometimes over the years of a marriage that is less than what it should be, I think even wives who are members of the Lord's church lose sight of that fact. 
They lose sight of the fact that the rest of the world regarding sexual expression and sexual fulfillment is a dry, arid desert so far as their husband should be concerned. And that she alone, his wife, is his only oasis in this desert wasteland of sexuality. That's a weighty responsibility. A weighty responsibility, not only for wives, but also for husbands. I want you to turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Brother Robert R. Taylor dealt with this. But of course, the nature of his lecture yesterday he had to cover so much material in a limited amount of time. He was not able to deal with it very long or very much in depth. And I'm not going to try to do that either, but I do want to touch on it again this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we see here the Bible's teaching that not only are wives, but husbands also, spouses are to provide for each other sexually. Notice in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 2, Nevertheless, Paul writes, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, singular. And it's not only monogamous there, but it's exclusive. She is my own wife. I am her own husband. Notice the conclusion of verse 2. Not only monogamy, but also exclusiveness. Verse 3, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Let him be sexually available, sexually responsive to his wife. And likewise also the wife, let her be sexually available and sexually responsive unto the husband. Verse 4, the wife hath not power of her own body but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. See, many times we lose sight of that. The day that I committed myself to Beth Williams, on that day my body was no longer mine. And it hasn't been since. And on that day, from that day forward, her body is no longer hers. That body belongs to me now. We belong to each other mutually. And then verse 5, and I like the way Brother Taylor dealt with this yesterday, a statement that stuck in my mind. He called it, I think, sexual blackmail. There's no place in the Christian home, and no place in any home as God would have it, for sexual blackmail. Paul says defraud. That word means cheat. Cheat ye not one the other. In other words, don't withhold yourself from your spouse sexually except it be with mutual consent for a time, a temporary period, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And then Paul says, come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency, your lack of control perhaps. And friends, here the Bible makes it crystal clear that we are to be available to each other sexually. But let me tell you something I've found in my studies along these lines. You read 1 Corinthians 7, and you hear preachers preach on 1 Corinthians 7. And you know, if we're not careful, I fear sometimes that audiences may come away with the wrong impression of this text. If you're not careful, I feel like sometimes the impression you leave with after hearing a preacher deal with these verses is, well, I've got to do it. You know, I'm married now, and, and I'm a wife, or I'm a husband, and, and so, you know, it's just my duty to be sexually available to my spouse. And so, let me tell you something I found. Regarding sexuality, I think in the New Testament, the aspect of its holiness is stressed in the New Testament more. It is very holy. It is as God would have it to be. But in the Old Testament, at least my impression Human sexuality, the holiness likewise is stressed of it, but even more brought out in the Old Testament is the happiness of it. Friends, for husbands and wives, our attitude toward this aspect of our relationship should not be one simply of duty. You know, I've got to do this. You know, I'm, I'm going to begrudgingly comply. That's not the biblical attitude. One book I read, this was a number of years ago when I was studying for a particular series or something, the, the, the way the authors put it just astounded me because I'd never heard it put so plainly and yet so accurately. They said it was a husband and wife writing together. They said, we cannot, un, we cannot overestimate the importance of people's understanding the Bible's pro-sexual message. You don't think in those terms, do you? Oftentimes you may not. 
See, we hear so many sermons about the improper place of sexuality, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, that if we're not careful, sometimes we forget God has glorified this in the home between husband and wife. It's a very beautiful thing. And I want to show you one passage from the Old Testament that substantiates what I said about the Old Testament seeming to emphasize the happiness, whereas the New Testament often seems to emphasize the holiness. And both are involved. I want you to turn over to Proverbs chapter 5 with me. Proverbs chapter 5. Here the wise man, he's not writing to women but he's writing to his son or his pupil regarding things that are going to be beneficial for both males and females, okay? So we can make the application. Notice in Proverbs 5 and verse 15, Solomon counsels his, his pupil. He says, Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the street. I prefer the American Standard Version there in, in verse 16, which puts it in the form of a question. In other words, should your fountains be dispersed abroad or should your, should your rivers of waters be in the streets? Now what he's dealing with here using the figure of water is the sexual relationship. And he's dealing in verses 15 and 16 with the idea of faithfulness. I'm going to give you three F's. The first one is faithfulness from these first two verses. He says, look, you need to be faithful to your wife, young man. And by, by contrast, or not contrast, on the other side of the coin, you need to be faithful to your husband, young lady. Be faithful. Drink waters only out of your own cistern, your private well, and running waters out of thine own well. Instead, verse 16, if you go to other sources for this fulfillment, it's like drinking the polluted water that runs in gutters. The waters in the streets, verse 16. Too many men and women alike don't realize that. Faithfulness. Now notice 17 and 18. He says, let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Keep your spouse to yourself. Keep yourself to your spouse so as to keep each other mutually satisfied Verse 18, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Verse 19, let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Solomon here uses a word. The word translated ravished is also from the Hebrew word which means intoxicated. And so he's counseling his young son, perhaps a young husband, he says, look, now that you're married, or if not, when you get married, he says, you need to always be intoxicated with the love of your wife. You don't need to go after these other women. But wives, the plain and simple fact remains, if you're not available, then that's going to be an impediment to this here in verse 19. Your husbands need you to love them sexually. Here in verses 17 and 18, 19, these three really, this is fascination. We see the faithfulness of that marital relationship, but we also see the fascination that husbands and wives are to work at keeping for each other down through verse 19. And then notice verse 20. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? The final elf here is foolishness. It's foolish for men and women, husbands and wives, not to cherish, not to revel in that sexual aspect of their relationship, appreciating what they have and protecting it. It's foolish not to do that and to go outside of the marriage relationship to seek that sexual fulfillment. So remember the faithfulness, the fascination, and the foolishness that Solomon deals with there. But now as our time's about gone, we need to move to the third area in which wives, your husbands need you to love them. They need you to love them domestically. They need you to love them sexually. But they also need you to love them spiritually. And yes, even men need to be loved emotionally. Now, I know the stereotype is that women are the more emotional gender, right? That's the stereotype. Women are emotional. We men, we're logical. And there's a lot of truth in that, a lot of truth. But be that as it may, still we as men, logical men... We still need to be loved emotionally. Amen. 
Now, what do we mean by that? I want you to turn over, first of all, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm lumping these two together. I'm lumping spiritual and emotional love together, even though they are not the same. Okay, they are different. But I'm lumping them together because for the intent of our discussion today, there are some things that maybe go hand in hand. First of all, let's deal with the spiritual emphasis. Wives, your husbands need you to love them spiritually. Now the way that you best love your husband spiritually is by urging him, encouraging him, and allowing him to fulfill his spiritual role. His spiritual role is to be the head of your household, the head of you, the wife, the head of your children. He is to be the spiritual head of that household, and you can love him best by urging him to do that, encouraging him, building him up to do that, and perhaps most importantly, allowing him to do that. Read in Ephesians 5 and verse 25 beginning. Paul said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What was and what is the final end or the final objective of Christ's love for the church. His final objective was to take the church to heaven. Now wives, the final objective of your love for your husband should be to help your husband go to heaven and to go to heaven with him and to go to heaven with your children. But if you do not encourage him and allow him to be the spiritual head of your home, then you're not doing that. What does it mean to be the spiritual head of the home? Let me tell you some of what it means. Men, it means that when it gets right down to brass tacks, as we say, when the rubber meets the road, you have to make the hard decisions. Now, he is a fool who makes those hard decisions alone. He is a fool who does not seek the counsel, the input of his wife. But when all things are said and done, you cannot let the hard decisions fall on her shoulders. They're not her responsibility. They're yours. What hard decision are you talking about, preacher? Well, what about job decisions? Decisions in your job, decisions that are going to affect how much time you're away from them, how much time you're away from the assemblies of the church, what part of the country you're going to have to relocate your family to? What kind of influence are you going to be exposed to on a daily basis? That's a hard decision. Now you see why husbands and wives have to talk about those things together. Absolutely. But the final decision has to be the man's. Men, you have to make the right decision. And wives, he needs you to be supportive. If he makes the right spiritual decision, which is going to prove to be best for your family, best for your congregational life as a family in the church, and that means that he's going to be losing $20,000 a year, wives, he needs your support in that. He doesn't need you throwing it up in his face where you could be making a whole lot, money, a whole lot more money right now. And then they're all the time having to defend, yeah, but we probably wouldn't be faithful 10 years from now either. <laughs> Tell you what, there's some hard decisions husbands have to make. And wives, you love your husband spiritually by encouraging and allowing him to make those proper decisions and supporting him in the decisions that he makes. You also love him emotionally in many respects in that vein. Now, I'd intended to say much more about this. Time's not going to permit me to. But one final thing about loving your husbands emotionally. I want you to turn over to the book of Proverbs with me. And this is how we're going to begin our conclusion. I know it's a stereotype, and I know it's not altogether fair. But you're familiar with the stereotype of the, quote, nagging wife, right? Brother Moser touched on this briefly last hour. Friends, sometimes we get all up in arms about stereotypes. But what baffles me and, and what I don't understand people won't realize, things become stereotypes for a reason. 
Have you ever thought about that? Now, is that to say that men cannot be nagging and, and just despiteful? No. Some husbands don't deserve the women to whom they're married. Okay? But in the makeup of a woman, the way that you're put together as a woman, and in the makeup of your husband as a man, the way he's put together as a man, there can especially be problems in a marriage from a nagging wife. Now, if that were not the case, then you tell me, pray tell, why? Why does Solomon deal with it so often in the book of Proverbs? Turn over with me to Proverbs chapter 19, and I will briefly go through these. Look at verse 9. It is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop, you've heard this proverb, than with a brawling woman, a contentious woman, a quarrelsome woman, some modern translations read, in a wide house. Have you ever known people that would rather fight than breathe? You've been around those people. Some people are not happy unless they're stirring up strife, right? And what's bad, what's really bad, is when we as wives or when we as husbands, when we somehow adopt that mentality in the home. I think some couples would rather fight than they had to live in peace and harmony. And that's wrong whether the woman's contributing to that or the man. Move down to verse 19, he says it likewise. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Sisters, if you have a hard time forgiving and forgetting, then the end result of that is going to be anger. It's going to be latent anger that you're going to hold perhaps over years, if not over decades, and it's going to be your downfall spiritually and likely the downfall of your home. And it applies to men as well. We need to forgive and forbear, Ephesians 4 and verse 32. But now move over to chapter 27. These are not the only times Solomon deals with this. Chapter 27, verse 15, he says, A continual dropping, this is like a, a leak on a rainy day, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. You know how they're alike? They both get old pretty quickly. <laughs> they really do. They both get old pretty quickly. All right, move over now to chapter 30. Chapter 30 and verse 21. For three things the earth is disquieted. The earth cannot hold these things. And for four which it cannot bear. And he gives four of them. Number one, it's not befitting when the servant is the one who reigns. Number two, it's not befitting for a fool to be filled with food. Number three, now notice this, it's not befitting that an odious woman be married. Now what does the word odious mean? I had to look that up. That word means hateful. Now ladies, if we, if we allow the things of our lives to so sour our dispositions that we grow to be hateful, unforgiving, quarrelsome, nagging persons, how are we going to square that with what the Bible teaches? There's no way. And it applies to the men as well. But in many aspects, it seems, to be more, it seems to be more of a problem sometimes for the feminine gender. Not always. But there seems to be a propensity there if we are not careful. Well, now that I've made everybody mad, I guess we can close, right? <laughs> let's close our Bibles and let's be taking our song books out the opening to the song that was given a few moments ago. Sisters, you can be the greatest gift that God has ever given to your husband during your lifetime. And I say this both to husbands and wives. We as spouses need to know that we hold the happiness we hold the happiness of our spouse in the palm of our hands, much like it were a little chick, a little chick. You can cradle and you can caress and you can protect that happiness of your spouse. Or you can crush it. You can crush it. And you can help serve to make your spouse's life miserable. And that applies to both men and women. Wives, please love your husbands. Love them domestically. Love them sexually. 
and love them emotionally and spiritually. Friends, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we want you to leave here a New Testament Christian. We want you to place your faith in Jesus Christ, John 8, 24. We want you to repent and turn away from sinful practice, Acts 17, 30. We want you to confess the sweet name of Jesus, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And we want to immerse you into Christ, buried with Him in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of your past sins, Acts 22, 16. We want you to leave here this morning saved and in a right relationship with God. Brother or sister, if you have done those things but you've not been living faithfully, we want you to come home this morning, repent in your heart, confess, I have sinned, those three words. We then can pray with you and pray for you, and God assures us He will forgive you, 1 John 1 and verse 9. There is so much work to do as a husband and wife, work to keep yourself pure and growing in the Christian virtues, work to get through the daily duties of life and providing for each other's needs. But the love that can be shared in the marriage relationship is a deep one, and with the right partner, the husband and wife can help each other get to heaven. The last few programs have been focusing on the husband and wife in the home and family, but our next lesson will begin to bring children into the picture of the family as we continue to look at roles and responsibilities of the members within the home and family. And then after we discuss roles and responsibilities later, we'll have a series of lessons that deal with threats to the family. For continued growth, study the Bible, God's Word. You can also take advantage of our materials to aid you in the study of God's Word. Feel free to use the materials on our website, www.truthfortheworld.org. There you can find tracts, articles, sign up for a free Bible correspondence course, as well as radio and TV programs that you can hear and watch. Be sure to be with us next time as we continue our study on the home and family. Garland Elkins will be leading us in a lesson called Children's Responsibilities to Parents and Parents' Responsibilities to Children. Again, as we continue looking at the roles and responsibilities that all of us are to fulfill within our home and family. But until that next lesson, we hope that you will continue reading the Bible, hope that you will continue taking advantage of the resources that are on our website, www.truthfortheworld.org, and follow God's commandments as God has given us words to live by. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth For The World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for...